Porter. I am uh, acting as chairman tonight in the absence of the chairman. Uh, <laughs> but we're here to hear one case tonight, and that case is case 1504, a uh, petition of Thomas F. Wise, trustee, who seeks a special permit under sections 5.3.2 and 5.7.2 of the zoning bylaws in order to make alterations and construct an addition to the existing single family dwelling and to create an accessory apartment on the property located at 181 South Street in Reading, Massachusetts. Uh, I will dispense with the reading of the abutters list except to the say that abutters were notified as were uh, all appropriate boards and commissions in town and members and associate members of the Board of Appeals as well as planning boards of Wakefield, North Reading, Woburn, Linfield, Stone and Wilmington. Uh, testimony taken before this board is taken under oath so if you think you're going to offer testimony I'm going to ask you to rise and raise your right hand if you think you're going to have something to say. I swear that the testimony given by me before this board will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. The response is I do. I do. Okay. Uh, <laughs> sir, when, when uh, open to public comment, um, if you are going to address the board, if you would identify yourself by name and address kindly, we would greatly appreciate it, as would our recording secretary. <clears throat> All right, Mr. Wise. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, does Mr. Wise know or is aware of the fact that there's only four members sitting? Oh yeah, we should yeah we should put that on the record. There was um, I did see some uh, back and forth between Mr. Wise and I think it might have been Maureen. Maureen called and said we didn't need to know about it. And so we should we should put it on the record. You know that uh, normally sitting on this board uh, there are a couple additional members. One has one is unavailable, and one has recused herself. Uh, because she felt she had a conflict. Uh, in order to get the relief that you seek tonight, you need three out of four of the sitting members uh, to rule in your favor. Um, and knowing that, uh, you choose to move forward or you have the option to continue until there is, there is a more full board sitting to arguably increase your chances of, a, uh, of needing less of a majority. So I have under, I understand that. There was one point of clarification I had with Maureen versus our last meeting. Um, when we last met, there were five of you, and I was told I need a supermajority. Three of five would not give me a supermajority. Four of five needed to give me a supermajority. So I see no difference between three of four versus four of five. Therefore, I'm waiving the right for a fifth person. Okay. As long however, as supermajority is the residing member. However, in section 16 of 48, um, it appears that if we had a three-member board uh, concurring, uh, it would be unanimous. It would be unanimous. If we have a five-member board, um, four out of the five have um, got to be uh, on board with the decision. And that's under section, uh, is that any decision or is that just variance? No, that's variance and special permit. It's under the uh, section for the procedures for the board. We used to have a three-member board. Um, I, I see this as, I don't see this as applying to a special permit. Okay. I see this as applying only to a reversal of the building inspector's decision. Okay. Or an application for a variance. You want to take a look? Mm -hmm. I just want to make sure I get another opinion that agrees with me. Okay. No, that, another opinion. Yep. <coughs> and we might as well pass it down to Eric. Yeah, Eric will. I agree. I agree. Yeah. So the way I read that, Eric, is that, and well, you go ahead and read it and see if you agree with uh, yeah. that. Yeah. So, in, in essence, your, um, <coughs> you, for a special permit, you didn't, wouldn't have needed a super majority. Okay. Um, in this case, because there are only sitting members, a majority would require a three out of four. Okay. 
Okay. Because of the because there are only the four difference. of us. Okay. Right. So if you had a fifth member, it would be three out of five. But because there are four of us, you need three out of four. I'm still comfortable with the vote. Okay. Good. I want to just make sure I get it yeah. on the record. No, I appreciate uh, that. Mr. Wise, the floor is yours. Okay. Um, first, I want to apologize for my appearance. I just as I was telling Mr. Cayet, I just came from a soccer practice, so ran home, changed, went to soccer practice, ran from soccer practice to here. So. Please don't take any disrespect from my appearance. You don't look like the guy that's still playing soccer. <laughs> Not me, my kids. Oh. Coaching. Coaching is soccer fan. Um, so, although it's not really a, applicable, I'll just give you a, kind of the background about why I'm asking, even though you probably have heard it before. Um, I, uh, my wife's parents are getting to a point where living by themselves is not something they're able to sustain financially or from a health perspective. My father-in-law, unfortunately, just recently had a heart attack and a bypass surgery, and he's going in for back surgery. My mother-in-law has a degenerative knee and is having challenges, so from a family perspective, that's essentially the reason why we're going for this petition, to do the in-law apartment. Even though it is an accessory apartment, our intention is to use it as an in-law only. Um, so in addition to that, as you're well aware, uh, accessory apartments from a Reading planning perspective aligned to the 2006 master plan. So from our perspective, it meets what Reading is looking for overall as well, and it allows the family, the nuclear family, to stay together. Um, as you read in the initial point, um, we're going for the special permit. There's no variance necessary. Um, I believe you have uh, in your notes and in your record the review from the uh, building uh, commissioner, um, who, if I'll just read it out of uh, for point of inclusion here, uh, it says, as EVA chairman, I will not be attending the April 16th meeting. I'll be out of state. Case 1504, 181 South Street is an application seeking special permit under sections 532 and 5472 of the zoning bylaws in order to construct an addition and to create an accessory apartment on the property located at 181 South Street. I have reviewed the drawings for this application and the proposed, proposed plans. Comply with the zoning bylaws. I have no issues or concerns with this proposal. The parking driveway request has been approved by the Board of Selectmen March 18, 2004. See the enclosed minutes. And the enclosed minutes also include a minutes from the most from the March 24th of this year meeting, whereby I went by to make sure that I didn't need to go and ask for anything else. And the board essentially said, as long as nothing changed, you don't need to ask for anything. And the driveway has stayed where it is, so nothing's changed, so there was nothing additional to be done. I was there. You were there. Yes, you were. Um, <coughs> So, uh, in addition to that, so then the new bylaws, as I'm sure you're also well aware, because I was here when you were reviewing them, um, have taken out the 1982 portion of the bylaw, which restricted the location, at least from an interpretation perspective, of where the accessory could be, and, and essentially allows me to build an addition to put an accessory in. Um, as the bylaws are now written, I have to come here for a special permit for that, so I'm here. If I was just build, adding it into an existing addition, I would have it by right. But I'm here for a special permit because I want to do it all at once, essentially. Um, so the standards as I see them, um, if you go down the list from A, it says that there can only be one accessory apartment on the property. There's only going to be one accessory apartment. Check. Um, B is where it could get uh, a little bit interesting, and I believe you have the architectural drawings on as you're available. And I think I'm compliant no matter how you interpret this from my perspective, and I think the building commissioner agrees with that, but I think you may want to look at how you want to interpret this going forward. Um, if you look at this ruling, the, the special permit process allows for the building of a brand new house with an accessory apartment or the addition to an existing house. As the building commissioner understands it, he is reviewing this as gross of the existing house as opposed to it, the, the 2B house, okay? So if that is, con if that is your interpretation, I'm okay with that because I'll fit within that, but I think you may have problems in the future if you interpret it that way. So just if we follow that interpretation of the, two, of the existing house, the gross of the existing house is 462 in the finished basement, 1,269 on the first floor, 914 in the second floor for 264 square feet, which one third of that number would be 880, 881 square feet max. Um, the gross of the accessory apartment will be 807 feet, which is less than that. 
The other portion of the interpretation that Glenn put forward is he is comparing the net of the accessory to the gross of the existing. It's the way he's interpreting B. As much as we tried to clear up the language, that's his interpretation of B. So if that's the case, instead of the 807 to the 881, the net of the, of the accessory is going to be 598 square feet. And that is 238 square feet in the living room, 167 square feet in the kitchen, 197 square feet in the bedroom. Now the bylaw rules also specifically have changed the definition of net to include habitable space only, which means the bathroom and the closets are out. They don't count for net square feet in the, in the new calculations. That's why they're not included. Uh, but the amounts would be, if you care, uh, 50 square feet in the bath, 27 square feet in one closet, nine square feet in another closet, so a total of 684 square feet if you care about that number. But I would suggest you don't need to, according to the new bylaws. So, in my interpretation of B, whether it's the 2B house or the existing house, I'm within both the one, one third of the gross square footage and between the 400 and 750 square foot of the net square footage that's required. Does that make any make sense? Okay. Um, the next section says that one owner must be living in either, the, the owner of the building must be living in either the accessory or the primary. And I'm here to tell you that I will be living in the primary. I am the owner in the trust. So you'll also notice that the filing was officially filed under Wise Living Trust. I'm a trustee of the trust, so I'm living there. I, I will be living there. Um, the next question says it must maintain the appearance of a single family dwelling. Uh, and this one was one we had talked about in the past as well. And you can see the appearance of the house as is on A9 of your architecture slides and the appearance of the house as it will be on A10 of the architecture slides. Um, I suggest to you that maintains the house, the look of a one family house from a, from a look and feel perspective. Uh, obviously that's up to interpretation, but my, my suggestion is it does maintain the look. The doors that you see on the front of A10 are the existing doors. There are two existing doors, one by the garage and one that's the front of the house. The bylaw says that one of the doors needs to be made more prominent, essentially, to make it clear as it's the front door. And the, the architecture drawings call for a, essentially a portico to be put in front of the front door, the, the, the main front door, to make it more prominent and agree with the, the bylaws as they are. The next portion of the bylaw calls for uh, external stairs to the second and so for stairs to the second and third floor to be internal. I have no worries with that. I've got no stairs outside going anywhere. All the stairs are internal, so that's completely in line. The next one talks about the entrances. Um, I sort of referred to this in the previous one. The, we will be adding a third entrance, but it will be on the side of the accessory apartment. And you can see that show up in the architecture drawings on A10 again. As you will see the side entrance show up on the side cut. Um, hold on a second, that's the wrong side. It's actually better to look at it on the, on A6. On A6 you can see that the entrance is on the side of the building, not on the front of the building. So here's the main front front door. Here's the entrance on the side of the accessory that will be used for the primary entrance. Okay. The next one talks about the driveway and there shall be none unless it's approved by the Board of Selectmen. I've established that and the Building Commissioner established that that's already been approved by the Board of Selectmen. The next one talks about public water and other utilities. It's already on public water. It will stay on public water. No issues there. Um, the last one talks about the amount of occupancy necessary. The last one that's applicable talks about the amount of occupancy necessary in the accessory. There should be no more than three people. There will be two people, my mother-in-law and my father-in-law. Um, with that, I close my statement for now and open for questions if necessary and or any other comment. All right, I'm going to... Uh 
open it up to uh, questions from board members, if any. Um, and we'll start to my left with John. Um, I did talk to the uh, building uh, inspector uh, this week. Um, and I think, I believe what he said is that he was not down to the site. He didn't go through the, the house or the, uh, the, or the calculations. Previously, in, I think that in the last 30-some-odd um, years, we've had the accessory apartment on the books. I don't think that we've had more than about 10 or 12 that have actually been filed. But in each of the cases, except for the last two, um, the board members have always gone out to evaluate or sent uh, somebody like the building inspector out to make the uh, to verify the calculations. Um, I just did my calculations and I didn't come up with any of the same numbers that you're coming up with. So my first question of you is, do you have any verification, uh, any, any, um, can you run through the numbers for us? And I'm looking specifically at uh, Part B. Of course. What would you like to start with, sir? Well, um, you can start with uh, gross um, footprint of the, of the existing structure. Okay. Um, and under the uh, definition of gross um, floor areas, the sum of the areas of several floors of a building or buildings measured from the outside surfaces of the exterior walls at each level intended for occupancy or storage. So if you're looking at that, um, if you're looking at the basement through the third floor or through the second floor, the three floors there, yep. you have virtually almost the same um, uh, square footage on each of the floors. That's just for the gross. Um, it, that is not correct, necessarily, although that would give me more space than what I am giving Exactly. Um, so if you want to interpret it that way, I'm okay with that, frankly, but it, it's not the way my certified architect interpreted it, um, and you're missing another key point about the B definition of gross where it specifically includes and excludes certain things. The definition of gross, I agree with what you just said, but then in the B definition, it specifically says minus. finished Correct. basement minus this, minus that, minus that, right? So in our calculation, we only included the finished basement portion, okay. not the entire basement portion. I was trying to give you the benefit of the doubt. Yeah, I appreciate that, but I, I really don't think I need it unless you okay. come up with another issue later on, but we'll see as time goes, Okay. right? Um, so we concluded the finished basement, which um, as calculated by the architect is 462 square feet. Uh, we included the first floor, which as you properly said, is the outside walls in, and we calculated 1,269 square feet in that space. Um, and the second floor, because of the eaves and the way in which it goes back and it's a cape, it's not the same size as the first floor from a gross perspective, because the walls are not fully out, which is the difference between what you just said and what I'm saying. And so that's why we come up with 914 on the second floor. And that's uh, the same justification that I'm sure that the assessors, uh, when they um, did their analysis, uh, which is on the second page of the uh, that page, they specified what they felt was the square footage. Um, they had 1,108. Um, 1108, and the basement was 856, 858. But that again was minus the um, exceptions, which is in B of uh, 5.473. Um, but now I'm going to come to the more difficult portion of it, which is the part that I had difficulty with. Okay. And that is the actual accessory apartment. Okay. Um, can you run over your uh, bedroom? The bedroom? Mm -hmm. The bedroom number that the architect came up with is 193 square feet. Okay. I came that's up with the excess, that's the That's the net, not the gross. So from a gross perspective, I have to refer to the plans if you want gross. Do you want gross? Uh, 
So what you're including in that is the closet as well as the, the bedroom? The closet is not included in the 193 square feet now. Uh, then what are you using for measurements for the bedroom? So frankly, she did it, the architect, and I'm trusting the architect that she, her measurements and her CAD program is working properly. Mm -hmm. um, but if we what look at- you on, Tom? What's I'm that? Sorry, what um, A6 is probably the best place to look, sir. Thanks. Yes, that's what I'm looking at. So from our, so just so we're clear on what we're talking about from a, a net perspective, we're talking about only the bedroom, the kitchen, and the living room. We're not talking about the closet in the bedroom, or the base, or the bathroom in the bedroom, or the closet in the front room. Okay. Okay. So that bedroom, if you look at the calculations, the inside walls are 13 feet four inches by 14 feet six inches of the bedroom. Okay, and you did that out and the calculation came out to be what? Well, the architect did that out, but I'll do it out right now okay. too, just to make sure we're on the same page. And her calculation came out to 193 square feet. So 13.4 is 13.33 times 14.5, 194.618. So it's pretty close. It's off by 1.6. Okay. Uh, and let's do the kitchen. So the kitchen would be inside, calls for 16 uh, feet, mm -hmm. and by 10.2 feet. So 2 divided by 12 is 1.6, 1 1.66, plus 10, so 10.167 times 16 equals 162.66. She had 167. So it's actually less now than what she said it is. Yep. Yep. And then the living room? The living room is going to be 15 by 16 mm -hmm. minus a certain number. So let's do 15 by 16 first. That's 240 minus 2 feet by an unmeasured number. So she, but she gave me the number as 9 square feet. So it would be um, Two, two feet times 4.5, give or take, so 231. So again, she's a little bit over, um, but we're still, depending on you know rounding error, instead of 598, we're at 590 square feet, well within the 400 to 750, and well within the one-third number of gross. Okay, I just, that that's part of it. Okay. Now that was the easy part. Okay. <clears throat> The other more difficult part comes with uh, part A, performance standards of the bylaw. Okay. And this is the, the part of it that, that bothers me about the term accessory apartments versus what you're looking at is an in-law apartment. We don't have in-law apartments. And accessory apartments, um, in, the sec in the second sentence there, the accessory apartment shall be, be a complete separate housekeeping unit containing both kitchen and bath. Yep. Not, I'm not concerned about the last part. I'm concerned about um, that they are separate and distinct. Okay. Okay. Um, first of all, we don't have uh, a separate and distinct. Um, we don't have two means of egress, which I don't care about at all. That's up to you and the building inspector. But right now... Um, What's not separate and distinct, sir? Uh... You have two areas called shared study. A shared study and a shared summer, summer room, yeah. Right. That's not separate and distinct. So if I called it my study and my summer room, I mean. Put a wall there uh, at the uh, back of the kitchen, that's separate and distinct. The intention of, of the bylaw all the way back to 1982 mm -hmm. was to create more affordable living units within the town. Okay. If you have, if you have um, an in-law, again, the in-law means that the, the parents and whomever can flow between one unit and the other unit because they're not individual units. They're one and the same. They just appear to be separate and distinct. You don't have two separate and distinct with shared common areas. I've talked about this with the building inspector. Um, it was either the end of last week or early this week. I think it was the end of last week. And that's a, a, 
uh, something he was having difficulty with, but I think he passed passed by that. But that's one of the things that bothers me the most. And to top that off, the stairways that you have uh, on uh, A6. Yes, sir. Uh, and it would be A5. Yes, sir. Which is the proposed basement. Yes, sir. You have staircase going down there, which means that the unit owner, the unit resident in the accessory apartment then has access to the bottom floor of the basement. That's not a separate and distinct unit, and if that's the case, then um, we're looking at far more than the 800 or the 750 that you're talking about right here, the accessory apartment. Um, I'll take exception to that because it's not finished. It's, if you look at the rules about gross versus net, it's unfinished space, which is necessary for the way the foundation is being laid. Whether it's separate and distinct, I think that's an interesting discussion to have, frankly. Um, I hadn't heard it before, the two meetings we were here before. We didn't talk about it being separate in, that, in such a fashion like that. Um, the previous examples that I had brought back in July had doors that opened between the two buildings. So they weren't any more separate and distinct than this from my interpretation. And I'll, I can try and dig up the details if necessary. Um, but that basement would be unfinished, so it does not apply to gross gross numbers and certainly does not apply to net numbers. Okay, so the wine cellar really doesn't have any connotation that it would be finished. No. And the only person who would have access to that would be the people in the unit, the accessory apartment. The only people that would have access to it? Yeah. No, it's open to, it's underneath exactly. the main part. Main it's part of the again, it's common area. It's shared, quote, shared area. Sure. So, um, that's the, the problem I'm having, and I, my intent is not, <laughs> not to come after you as an individual. Mm -hmm. It is the first case before this board under the new zoning regulations. Yep. And the new zoning regulations um, are going to be well tested. So whatever we do this evening is going to, to set um, kind of a... Now, I won't say a benchmark, but give you an I give people an idea of what the, the board is willing um, to accommodate and what the board is not willing to accommodate well, I under that. new regulations. I understand that. I, I I don't have it with me, although I could probably pull it up. I don't think that Section A has fundamentally changed. I think the only fundamental change that I recall, in addition to the fact of the and Mr. Tonyello, you wrote Zach, so you know exactly what was changed. But the in addition to the the portion about external buildings and carriage houses, which is not applicable in our case. The only fundamental change was removing the 1982 portion of the bylaw. It's fundamentally, from a fundamental perspective. So um, I, I hear you, but when I read the, the Reading Master Plan materials, while it, it does include the terms in laws in there, not just accessories, it is, that's the expectation. In fact, it specifically talks about the fact that we have an aging population and we want the, the aging population to be able to live with their younger you know, family members. So I don't believe that that's the intent and I know in the discussions I was in in the ZAC, that was not the intent that was discussed. But I would defer to Mr. Troniello if I missed something in that regard. Um, I, I viewed it and as I said again, last April when we were here, last July when we were here, we didn't talk about the separate. Maybe we just didn't get there because everything else was perfectly good or everything else was enough of a controversy. Well, I don't think we got there to tell that you may the not, That may be the case. Um, but again, I would say that the other two cases that passed before this case had connections between the, build, between the two units that were inside the building. And then neither one was a unanimous decision. But that's beside the point. Yep. Well, actually, one was a unanimous decision, I think. I could be wrong. If you know you voted against it, then <laughs> okay. <laughs> and for that, for that same reason. Okay. For that same reason. Because they weren't. Because they, there's a question of what does in-law, how does in-law differ from accessory? And the difference is part A um, of the bylaw, where it says must be uh, distinctly separate. 
So in the conversations I was in, and again, I'll defer if, if Mr. Tronio looks to correct me, I'll be corrected. I have no problem with that. Mm -hmm. In the conversations I was in, we were clearly discussing in law and accessory interchangeably, universally usable between the two. The reason it was accessory was just because people were more comfortable with accessory and it gave the ability for people to rent the, the apartment to somebody else. Uh, there is a door between that that can be closed and locked. It's just not a closed and locked building. There's a door there. Yes, our intention is to share it, um, but you know we can go through that if necessary. That's all I have for you. Okay, sorry. Well, the conversation has transpired has answered most of the questions I had already listed. So, okay. uh, I tend to agree with you. I mean, an accessory apartment can be most anything. It can be an in-law apartment. It can be a totally different party. It could be a children coming home to roost. It could be a lot of things. That was one example, yep. Uh, accessory means a lot of things, uh, subject to interpretation, of course. Uh, I really don't have any fundamental problem. Uh, you walk through the, uh, the subparagraphs of, uh, of the required uh, area, and uh, you know the only problem I had when I first looked at this thing was the second driveway. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'll just editorialize and say that I think adding that second driveway, in a way, does detract from what is presented as a single family house. But you've done what you've done. Uh, you, you've complied with what has to be done. And selectmen have approved it, so you basically are not non-complying with the requirements of the bylaw. So uh, I don't have any other comment. Just real, I mean, on that one, I, I appreciate that feedback. I was very concerned about that concern, um, and I drove around a lot of Reading to look around. Um, to see how many different places had multiple driveways in one way, shape, or form. I don't have the records of whether they're accessories or not, so I can't, or whether they're two families or not, but there are multiple examples, even within my general neighborhood of the Josh Wheaton district, of houses with two, two garages on one side or the other of the house. Yeah. Um, so in my interpretation, while that's not a precedent, you can't use that as a precedent, it is a, does it fit the neighborhood conversation? And there are multiple examples. I have some pictures if you'd like to see them. I took a ride by the house and took a look at what you might do on the left-hand side of the property. And that's, so it's not easy to expand over there. No, it's we've got a pretty deep, pretty, we've got a real slope pretty going big down slope the going down there. Yep. So it really doesn't make much sense in my view, looking at it, to do anything over there. So uh, Thank I you, sir. have a comment. All right, Eric. I know that you put a lot of time into this the first time around, and obviously the second time around, you've done a great job going through the whole list of criteria. The only thing that I know probably will come up later is um, part uh, G, the last paragraph, any additional approved driveway space may not result in cars parking in the front yard. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming that your parents will have car, or your in-laws will have cars, Park there to access that side, uh, you know, entrance. Yep. What um, what what do you see? Do you see any challenge with that? So I don't see a challenge for two reasons, or three reasons. Okay. okay. The first reason is the definition of front yard is very clear and distinct about the, this the amount of stood setback from the beginning of being 20 feet. Mm -hmm. The driveway is 54 feet, so I'm going past 20. That's one okay. reason. The second reason is the address of the house is 181 South Street. The driveway is on Walnut Street. So it's a side yard. I could make the argument that it's a side yard. And the third reason is the Board of Selectmen already looked at it and approved it as required by that portion of the bylaw. Perfect. Just wanted to put that out there because I, I feel like that may be something that will be addressed later on and maybe other proceedings. Yep. And that just as a point of note, that was particularly a concern of mine when we were going through the Zach process as well. Mm -hmm. um, George, I can't remember his last name, um, maybe you know Mr. Triangle. Katsufis. Katsufis, and I went down and discussed it in particular. I said, here's the language. It says I can't park in the front yard. Here's my, my, my use case, right? Mm -hmm. I, I have a house on a corner. Where's my front yard? And, and in his particular case, he said, what's your address? I said, my address is 181 South Street. He said, so your front yard is on South Street. 
You're on Walnut Street, that's the side yard. So again, going to intent and purpose of some of these conversations, that's why I was asking those questions in that process, and that's the reason I can provide that answer. Uh, before I get into my comments, <coughs> you actually read it into the record, but I'd like to make sure that I enter into the record the uh, the email dated Wednesday, April fifteenth, from Glenn Redmond, that you that the applicant read into the record, giving his uh, opinion uh, on the application, attaching the minutes of the, uh, the the board of selectmen meetings, approving the curb cuts, basically. So I'd like to make sure we enter that into the record. Um, I'll do that during public oh. comment, okay. I think. Okay. Uh, do we have any situation, I'm, I'm looking, I'm jumping down specifically to uh, paragraph K of 5473, if you will. Mm -hmm. uh, do we have any, in your, petition, you mentioned that you're doing this to, to care for aging and sometimes health challenged seniors. Are there any features included in this application or included in your drawings, including in this accessory apartment that are being done specific, other than the entire accessory apartment, that are being done specifically to address issues relating to um, disabilities or mobility for your in-laws they have there are no official disabilities for them as it stands right now um, that said and for that reason we haven't done anything for the, the front entrance to make a ramp or anything else like that yet um, there is allowable space to do that if we need to in the future the one one thing we have done at their request is a shower and it's a walk-in shower so they do not have to lift their legs over anything so we specifically designed the shower to be a square walk-in shower with a, with a drain trough so that the water doesn't go out into the bathroom. So they do not have to walk in. And there's also, there will also be a seat there if they need to sit down as part of the shower process. Okay. That's the only thing that would potentially fit that criteria, Mr. Cunningham. So with the you know, and so to to address some of the um, some of your comments regarding the, the the changes to the bylaw specifically the, the zoning advisory committee and meetings the, those changes those meetings are reflected in the current bylaw we see today. Yep. Uh, and so things that that were recommended to the consultant and to daytime government to be changed were changed. Those that stayed the same, stayed the same, specifically that 5473 paragraph A that we mentioned earlier. Uh, you know, in-law apartments was, you know, too specific a term, if you will, given the need perhaps for wider usage uh, of the space, accessory apartments was the more acceptable term. Uh, you know, we did change the definition a little bit of gross and net. So, you know, I think we you went that through that in your mm -hmm. analysis. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you you've got your your approvals from the uh, from the board of selectmen regarding the curb cut in the driveway. Um, and I don't I don't have any further questions. So at this time, uh, I'm going to open up uh, this petition to public comment. If there's anybody in the in the gallery that would like to um, add anything to the proceedings, now is the time. Uh, please rise, identify your name and address, and be heard. Hi, my name is Tom Fox, and I'm from uh, 230 Walnut Street. Tudor is down where the proposal is uh, being suggested. My confusion is the difference of an in-law apartment versus an accessory apartment. And is that just terminology? Can an accessory apartment, apartment in the future be rented as a separate entity when and if time takes its toll and the in-laws are no longer there? Or the what would happen at that, at, at that point? Or, you know, some you sold the house, does it now become a 
house with a uh, separate apartment to then become a two-family? Well, to, to, an to answer your first question, there is no distinction made between the terms in-law and accessory apartment. So the in-law apartment is, is just a term of art that is used for these types of apartments. Uh, but the term accessory apartment is the official statutory, if you will, name in the bylaw. Uh, there is currently no uh, restriction on how, well, let me, let me back up. The restrictions on how an in-law apartment once grant, an accessory apartment once granted is used are laid out in the steps necessary to grant the permit for that accessory apartment. For instance, uh, it can only have a certain amount of bedrooms. It can be occupied by more than three people. Uh, but there is no restriction on renting that space out to persons other than family members as long as one of the two units created is occupied by the homeowner there is no restriction as to how that other unit can be utilized. Does that, does that answer your yeah, question answer adequately? Question. Yep. Okay, great. Thank you for your uh, input. Go ahead, Tom. Can I address the second part of the question? Sure. The second part of the question with regards to if it's sold, oh. right? Oh, yeah. Um, in, in 5474 of the process, it says the special permit is limited to the original applicant. However, it may be transferred upon another review by this board when it's sold, essentially, okay. so it would otherwise revert to a single family with no with no in law if that if that failed. Okay, thank you. That's my interpretation, but you guys can clean that up if I messed it up. Well, I mean, ultimately, there's not a there's not a real way to police that. the The building inspector, I don't think, has a process in place upon the sale of a property with a permitted accessory apartment to actively inquire of how the new owner proposes to use it uh, but once it's permitted it, it certainly is, is subject to review I don't know do the other board members have any opinion on that I agree with you okay I would also just one more thing for clarity for your comfort mm -hmm. you have the right to go to the building inspector after it's sold and say can you look at that or can you come back mm -hmm. last last summer there was one example that came here for that particular reason well did have to reissue an occupancy permit to a new owner. Yep. So I guess it would be There's addressed at that point. Yes, exactly. Uh, the, there is no need, to, once an occupancy permit's been issued, there's no need to reissue an occupancy permit upon transfer of ownership. Okay. So there is, the, when, when, when you sell your house, the new, the new owner doesn't need to get a new certificate of occupancy from the building department upon transfer of title. Okay. So it would be, as, as Mr. Wise correctly uh, surmised, that if, if the neighbors uh, are concerned about how a proposed new owner might be utilizing that space, um, it would be that owner's choice to notify the building department and ask for an inspection. Okay. One, one other quick question. There, there is an approved curb cut for the right-hand side of the house? Yes, sir. The side where the bay is? Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. That was approved by the Board of Selectmen, yes. Okay. On a couple of occasions. Yes. And it was also taken before CPDC and approved by CPDC as well. Any other comment by members of the audience? <coughs> Here. So, I'm sorry, sir. If Before you speak and we want to hear you speak, you need to be sworn because all testimony before this board sure. is on the road. Come up here. So please yeah. raise your right hand. You can stay where you are. Uh, all testimony before this board is taken under oath, so uh, I swear that the testimony given tonight before this board shall be the whole truth. Uh, so help me God that this response is I do. I do. Thank you. Your name and address, please, sir. Gary Jufri, uh, 189 Felt Street. I'm a neighbor of, of the Wises. And I appreciate the diligence that the committee puts. Um, it's my opinion he's doing this for, for the right reasons, with the right intention of bringing his, his in laws in. And I just like to say I don't have a, uh, any issues at all with. Um, with what, what they're doing. I don't think it's going to negatively impact the neighborhood. I think it's going to be a, a nice addition uh, to his to his house and to our neighborhood. That's all. Thank you. Any other comments? No, sir. 
All right, I'll close the uh, public comment portion of the hearing. Uh, are there any more questions or comments by members of the board? I would only offer the comment. John made the comment earlier about shared space. And I think sometimes being absolutely honest can get you into questions and answers, okay? I mean, it's better off to just to call it a sunroom and call it something else and leave the shared word off. But, you know, it's, uh, we, we've seen that before. Like and it always it. raises a commentary and a question uh, on the part of this board. I appreciate that. I'd like to think that honesty is uh, recognized and a good quality these days. So <laughs> we'll see. Hopefully it is. <coughs> John? No, I mean, the uh, concern that I had was um, I would have thought that uh, in the ZAC committee they would have been able to come up with this. I know the intention is well um, versed, um, but you you run into you run into problems later on unless something like this gets gets uh, corrected because we're going from a a very restrictive accessory apartment bylaw to a very non-restrictive, uh, which leads to the potential of creating um, two-family residence and single-family zones. Um, and that, uh, in talking to some realtors in town and, and uh, the, ex the, um, the assessor's office, uh, most of the people come to Reading because they are single-family residences. Um, and that's what they want, that's what they're buying for. They're not buying the, the two-bedroom, uh, the two-bedroom, the two families are not selling as well as the single families are uh, in the town. But my point would be that, you know, if you can't draw the line somewhere, uh, this gonna, you're going to run into a problem somewhere down the line. Um, I mean, I, I could have seen another way of doing this if, if um, we weren't in such a rush to get this done now um, to make it a little bit more concise. But that's beside the point we're here now. We need to make, it a, make a decision this evening. So that's, I'll just leave it right there. I may address one thing real quick. Not sure. that it materially impacts your decision, but since last July, I've been looking and looking and looking and looking and looking for other houses that meet the criteria of what we're looking for. There was one that was truly an accessory, and it went like that. There have been others that have basement pseudo accessories. Those are sitting on the market. Those are the ones that are not able to sell. But the one that had a true accessory that was side by side, which, by the way, had an opening between the two buildings with a door, just like ours is, went like that. We couldn't get there fast enough. Uh, so, you know, without going too deeply into reopening discussions had at the beginning of the hearing or at the Zoning Advisory Committee, uh, you know, the changes to the bylaw were made to simplify the process and to allow for as much as a, a process for people to locate uh, families within residences that would accommodate them, either existing or uh, 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 rehabilitated or, or, or increased residences, was to offer an amnesty program of sorts to all of the uh, unpermitted accessory apartments in town so that we tried to control the proliferation as best we could as a town of uh, multifamily units, if you will. Um, and so I think that this process is the new bylaw that we see in place uh, was a compromise in relaxing the restrictions but offering an opportunity uh, for those that want to co-locate uh, to do so so that we could start getting an accurate count um, and perhaps have a little bit more control. Our, our prior bylaw listed a 10% restriction that was lifted in the current bylaw uh, because there's really no, there was really no way to measure it. So at least now going forward, we have a measuring stick. Uh, 
um, to allow it, but try to control it or at least have knowledge of it. Uh, so uh, I think we're, I think it's still a work in progress as mm -hmm. we see how it's applied to applicants that come forward. But I think it was a ultimately the um, good for the town. Uh, with that, I'm gonna. Um, Eric, did you have anything to add? Yeah. All right, I'll, uh, I'll close the hearing and entertain a motion from one of the members of the board. I'll take a crack at it. Okay. I move to grant the petitioner, Thomas F. Wise, a special permit under sections 5.3.2 5 5 and 5.4.7.2 of the zoning bylaw to make alterations and construct an addition to an existing single family dwelling and to create an accessory apartment on the property located at 181 South Street in Ray. Such alterations in addition to the existing dwelling and creation of an accessory apartment shall be in accordance with the plot plan enclosed with the application dated February 12, 2015, prepared by Bowditch and Crandall, Incorporated, 8 Pole Street, Belmont, Mass, and certified by John McEttron, professional land surveyor and architect, and also architectural drawings A1 through A11, prepared by Miller Design. 52 Stantler Road in Belmont as well. Uh, there are special conditions that go with special permit. Uh, one, the petitioner su shall submit to the building inspector a certified plot plan of the proposed construction and a proposed foundation plan prior to the issuance of a foundation permit for the work. Two, the petitioner shall submit to the building inspector final construction plans for the proposed structure along with the as-built foundation plan for that structure prior to the issuance of a building permit. And three, the petitioner shall submit to the building inspector as-built plans of the new structure prior to the issuance of an occupancy permit. Point of clarification. Any other? Anything else? Yes. You mentioned the pl plan that's marked February 12th. You said 2015. It is uh, actually 2014. Excuse. So just to clear that, clarify that. Uh, hold it, hold it. Uh, 2014, excuse me, you're absolutely right. Just want to make sure Plot we're on the same page. 2014. No, nothing little, no little thing gets in the way. You're absolutely right. Sorry about that. In your initial motion, uh, Cy, uh, did you want to also include uh, um, 5.4.7.3? Uh, did he ask for that? Nope. But that is the bylaw. The, perf the performance standard. Mm -hmm. Five four seven two is the restrictions. Five four seven three is actually the performance standards. The okay. A, through, yeah, right. A through K. Right. Five five four seven two and five four seven, seven three. three. Thank you. So moved. So moved. moved. Do I have a second? Second. Eric, second. Any further discussion? Hmm. Did you want to read this letter to Oh, you know, you, you no, you're you're absolutely right. Well, we have a we have a motion on the on the table. So. Um, Can't. Shall I withdraw it until you read that into the record mm -hmm. and read? Let me think about it for a second. I think. Um, You'd have to. Eric would have to remove his second first. Yeah. So, so in order to read that, yeah. Let me let me go back procedurally. What we'd have to do, I do want to read. I do want to make sure that 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 letter becomes part of the record. Um, so, what we would have to do is withdraw both the motion and the second. Let me read the letter into the record, and then we'll go through it again. I'll make it quick. Um, Chairman, I move to withdraw my second motion. Chairman, I would request a withdrawal of the motion. Okay, thank you. Accepted. And thank you, Eric, because I do want to make sure we put that. Uh, I'd like to make sure that I enter in the record a letter and email dated April 14th, 2015, from uh, Michael and Leanne Webb of Reading. 
uh, of 224 Walnut Street, Reading, uh, asking for the board to oppose the request for a special permit to create an accessory apartment at 181 South Street. Uh, the basis of their exception uh, is primarily related to the second driveway and uh, their opinion is that, the, among other things, is that the proposed construction would alter the single family character of the neighborhood. Um, Uh, they close with the ZBA may rule any way it wishes. However, if the second driveway is approved and is not compliant with the law, the decision will be subject to review in court. So um, I want to make sure that that's entered into the record appropriately uh, as well and that we've all heard it. Uh, sorry for the confusion, but at this point, we'll close the hearing and uh, entertain a motion. Sai, please. Do I have to read the thing all over again? Uh, I would say go ahead and make the motion uh, again. Okay, please. I move to grant the petitioner Thomas F. Wise a special permit under sections 532, 5472, and 5473 of the zoning bylaws to make alterations and construct an addition to an existing single family dwelling and to create an accessory apartment on the property located at 181 South Street in Reading. Such alterations in addition to the existing dwelling and creation of an accessory apartment shall be in accordance with the plot plan dated February 12, 2014. Prepared by Bo Ditch and Crandall, uh, 8 Hole Street, Belmont, Mass, and certified by John W. McKetron, professional land surveyor, and also the architectural drawings A1 through A11, prepared by Villa Design, 52 Staten Road in Belmont. Subject to the following conditions. Petitioner shall submit to the building inspector a certified plot plan of the proposed construction and proposed foundation plan prior to the issuance of a foundation permit for the work. Petitioner shall submit to the building inspector final construction plans for the proposed structure along with the as built foundation plans for that structure prior to the issuance of a building permit and petitioner shall, petitioner shall submit to the building inspector as built plans of the new structure prior to the issuance of an occupancy. I'm going to be able to say that by heart pretty soon. Okay, a second. Second. Correct second. Okay. Now, any further discussion? <laughs> None being heard. All board members in favor? Three. All board members opposed? One. The petition is granted. Hang out for a second. Let me stamp your uh, plans. Wise, um, we have 14 days to render an opinion, and there's an appeal period that follows. So, 30 some odd days from today, you should contact um, the office to get your special permit and have it recorded appropriately. 
In the meantime, these are your stamp plans that you can come get and take with you. Those will be go along with your Pilot. decision. Yes. Okay. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you very much. Ms. Saunders, thank you. Um, before I leave, I think you may want to talk about how you want to interpret B and talk to Glenn about how to interpret B. Considering how can you build something brand new and have the measurement be to B and have something you're doing in addition have the measurement be as is. Doesn't seem fair or equitable, but that's something for you guys to think through. Well, in light of that, then we should also talk to Building Inspector about A. Yeah, well, if we're going to talk to the building inspector, we ought to talk to him about all of the concerns that we might have. Okay. Thanks again, Good night. Good night. All right, well, that was, uh, that was the only thing we had on the agenda. Thank you for your patience while I work through my first meeting, chair in a meeting. Uh, we don't have anything on the, else on the agenda, so I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second? Second. Sigh. All those in favor? Four zero zero. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> Thank you. It's not rocket science, right? <laughs> As they say. Now, the question is, what do I do with this? Give it back. Back to Caitlin? Yeah. yeah. So I'll just you get all that down?